Hello and welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbeville. John Anderson is quick to tell you that his year-long service in Vietnam was not frontline duty, no direct combat. He even goes so far as to call his job an easy one. But after hearing his story, I really can't agree, and I doubt if you will. John Anderson did not fly the gunships, but he flew above them in his 01 Bird Dog single engine aircraft, guiding them identifying landing zones and areas to attack. Nonetheless, John Anderson counts himself fortunate to have come home from Vietnam alive, and you'll understand why. John, welcome. Been wanting to I have do. you on this show for a long time. You have <laughs> led me to a lot of veterans, and finally, I get you on the show. Uh, you served in Vietnam. You, you talk about that your job was not as combative as other jobs, but still, you do count yourself lucky to have come home from Vietnam because there were near misses in your service. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. It was very interesting. Talk about them. Well, uh, if to know what I went through, you'd have to know what I did, and, and I flew that 01 Bird Dog, which is an observation plane. Right. It's a Cessna with uh, a lot more power than the old L-19, and my job was to work with either naval gunfire or artillery or infantry on occasion, but it evolved that my main job was, I believe, getting Americans out of trouble, working with the Charlie Company 75th Rangers a lot my last six months, and working with a unit called the 1st of the 50th Mechanized. Mm -hmm. And uh, in doing that, I witnessed a lot of, of uh, fascinating things, uh, educational things, as to what people are capable of doing when they're challenged. Um, if you had an American in trouble, you had more help than you knew what to do with right. because everybody wanted to help out. In fact, uh, talking about working with the Rangers and you talked about identifying landing zones, I watched a uh, helicopter piloted by a man called Hoss Cartwright. had a big handlebar mustache. He was a big guy. His last name was Cartwright. Bonanza was popular in those days, so we called him Hoss. He flew a UH-1 uh, hotel or Delta model, I can't recall which, and we would load these Rangers onto the helicopters. We'd have some gunships or not, depending on what we were doing or where we were. And he would land, or the helicopter pilot would land in a succession of landing zones. Mm -hmm. And I, they were flying at treetop level, so I couldn't uh, fly over them and give away their position, and they couldn't see the landing zones. So I'd give them headings and count off the meters as they were approaching the landing zone, and they would go into each one, and at a prearranged landing zone, they would let the rangers out. Well, the North Vietnamese, for their part, being fairly smart, whenever they would come to a rest position, they would set up around the landing zone just in case Americans happened to land there. So we've got triple canopy jungle and then these clearings. And one day, Haas put a team on the ground he took off, the North Vietnamese would always wait until the helicopter took off, and they had put set up around this landing zone, and they opened up on the six-man team of rangers. We call them Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, or LERPs. As that happened, and as Cartwright was coming out of the LZ, he took a, at least one round through his main rotor blade, which set up a vibration that was pretty interesting to handle. And at that point, instead of flying away, he made that helicopter do something I have never seen before since. He did the tightest, steepest turn I've ever seen in a helicopter, and he did it at low level, right over those trees, and came back into the landing zone and sat there on the ground until every one of those rangers got on board. You could see tracers coming out of the tree line, flying by these guys. You know that there's four rounds, four bullets for every tracer you see, but he sat on the ground until everybody got on board and then took off. And it's the single bravest thing I've ever witnessed. Indeed. And that's just one of the fascinating stories that you came back from Vietnam with. A lot of them involved yourself. I want to uh, go back a little bit, talk about uh, your first joining the Army. You joined pretty much straight out of college. Correct. Went to Texas Western. You that's were right. you were in school there when they won the NCAA basketball uh, championship. I certainly was, and so was Ann, but we didn't know each other at that time. <laughs> My wife Ann was, uh, we met later on. You married your wife Ann uh, in 1966. You've been married nearly 39 years. So that's right. she, was, uh, she was an Army wife, and she was home when you were serving in Vietnam. Right. We didn't talk about this earlier, but that, that had to have been very difficult for, for you and her. It was. It's, uh, any, any separation is difficult. Separation under those circumstances 
is extremely difficult, and that's why I feel so for the troops that are serving now in Iraq and Afghanistan, as I have in every conflict we've sent people to. Right. Uh, I also uh, left a nine-month-old son, and he was 21 months when I got back, and, and that was a tough thing to do. Fortunately, you came home to a 21-month-old yeah, son. That's right. And that's right. good. Uh, your training in Georgia, you went to Fort Rucker, went to Fort Stewart, and you yeah. learned how to fly. I learned how to fly, initially uh, fixed wing training, initial entry fixed wing in, at uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, for four months, and then to Fort Rucker for four months, and uh, came out with uh, a single engine land, multi engine instrument rated, and uh, was glad to have it. <laughs> you had some experiences before you ever got to Vietnam that. Uh, that nearly <laughs> never got you to Vietnam. Uh, uh, talk about some of your early flying experiences. Well, I was uh, technically, I guess you could call them crashes, but I was in two incidents, uh, one in ROTC flight training at, in school, where my lack of experience uh, helped me to run off the runway into some sand and <laughs> stand the plane up on its nose. Uh, the other one was in, in flight school, flying with my, what you call stick buddy, Bobby Beal who in fact tried to kill me three times. But <laughs> this day, uh, he was doing a really bad landing. It was a beautiful spring day and I had my elbow on the windowsill of the plane, uh, the back seat, because it's a pilot sits in the front and observer in the back. And he rounded out about 10 feet too high and fell in and bounced. And then the engine caught and instead of going around, he closed the throttle again and bounced again up even higher. And finally the third time he was about 30 feet in the air. And when he came down, uh, I looked at the left wing tip and I thought, boy, that's awfully close to the ground and this is a really bad landing. <laughs> and uh, he got it straightened out heading uh, on the ground, broke ground like he was going to take off finally, heading for a tree line of 60 foot pine trees. And as I looked over his shoulder, I noticed that we weren't climbing and the trees were coming up fast. And I looked out of the corner of my eye and here were 60 degrees of flaps on that bird dog, uh, retarding our climb. So I said, uh, Bob, bring up your flaps, not all of them, just half. And I watched to make sure he stopped at the takeoff setting. And we went around. And uh, I s Bob said, John, I'm terrified. And I said, well, Bob, would you like me to land this from the back seat? And he thought a moment and said, I'm not that terrified. <laughs> so he came in and landed. And I found out after we landed that we had put the wingtip a foot into the ground, should have cartwheeled. But it cut cleanly through the ground and that until we got to the tree line, people on the ground could see trees above our aircraft. And that's when the flaps came up and we cleared the trees. You must have thought Vietnam's gonna be a breeze. Sure, sure. <laughs> if, if you could go through this. That's right. Uh, you went jungle training in the Philippines before you went to Vietnam. Yeah, Talk it, about what was involved yeah, there. Yeah, that was uh, jungle survival school. Mm -hmm. And they uh, taught us what we could eat and what we couldn't and taught us how to trap water uh, to drink. And uh, we made our own hammocks out of uh, parachutes and and heard all this uh, noise. We thought it was people walking around at night in the jungle. Turns out it's rats, and the jungle is full of rats, so it's not a vacation spot necessarily. Um, but they had people looking for us, and, and you had to try and keep from getting caught. And um, it, was, it was an interesting training. It, I think it prepared us pretty well in case anything happened uh, in country. And then you went in country. Uh, where exactly did you go initially? Where are you stationed? Well, uh, they have an interesting process. Mm -hmm. You go into uh, the Long Bin replacement depot, and uh, I got assigned to the 1st Aviation Brigade, which assigned me to the 17th Group in the Trang, which assigned me to the 223rd Battalion in Quinyon, which assigned me to the 183rd Reconnaissance Aviation Company at Phan Thiet, or actually uh, at Dong Batan across the bay from Cameroon, uh, which assigned me to the 2nd Flight Platoon at Phan Thiet. And Fanthiet is on the coast. Uh, it's a coastal plain about 20 miles deep and then mountains that range upwards of a little over 5,000 feet and uh, triple canopy jungle in the valley. And uh, the Nook Mom capital of the world. It's a Vietnamese sauce made from uh, very deceased fish. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it smells really bad when it's being made, but it's good to eat. <laughs> it tastes better than the than description of how to That's make right. it. Talk a little bit more, more specifically about what, what, what your job was in the, the, the bird dog, uh, so people will really understand exactly what your mission was okay. and how you helped out other pilots. Well, primarily it was reconnaissance. That was, that was the number one job, looking for the enemy wherever uh, we were assigned to look. Um, 
I did a lot of naval gunfire uh, support. I'd fly a Marine or Navy person in the back seat and we'd adjust the ship's gunfire you know, where they could reach inland. I worked with the artillery batteries to help them register and, and then I would fire artillery when there was an event that called for uh, attacking the enemy with artillery. I uh, worked with, uh, like I said, the 1st to 50th mechanized. Mm -hmm. My job, since they make a lot of noise and aren't going to surprise anybody, was to fire artillery in front of them and set off any mines that might be there. Uh, you'd get secondary explosions after your artillery round went off and that would indicate that there were mines in there. I got used to working with them a lot. And then the most interesting job really was the, was the Rangers, the 75th Rangers. Uh, that led to a lot of interesting events because their job was to go out into that mountainous area, into the triple canopy, 300 foot tall tree jungle mm -hmm. and find North Vietnamese. And our job was to help them, help them go in, to help them when they were there in case they lost communications or got in trouble, got jumped by a larger force, which happened all too often, and then to help them get out. And I would either use gunships to help get them out uh, if they were in contact or I'd uh, one, one occasion in particular, I was called on to fire artillery uh, that we had moved a battery on top of a mountain mm -hmm. and of uh, 105 millimeter uh, artillery. And uh, this six man LERP team was running from North Vietnamese. They'd gotten outnumbered and, and were being chased, running full tilt through the jungle. And my job was to call artillery on the Vietnamese, on the North Vietnamese. But I couldn't see anybody. I couldn't see the Americans. I couldn't see the Vietnamese. So I would call the artillery between the North Vietnamese and the Americans, and I would figure that it was between because the LERPs would tell me by the shrapnel coming through the trees if I was getting too close to them. And um, it was a situation when you're firing artillery close to U.S. troops, it's, it's very, uh, it, it can scare you. Uh, the most frightened I've ever been was when I used the wrong gun target line and thought I'd landed too close to some troops with an eight inch gun. But mm -hmm. uh, that'll ruin your whole day. But in this case, uh, because you're, you know you're flying, firing close to Americans, you first give the command to the artillery battery, danger, and then when it's really close, you say danger close. And that's the way it was this whole time until they got to an LZ and got picked up. And that I count as a, as a singular event, uh, helping those guys get out of trouble. You flew your aircraft not directly over the targets so as to not give away the location. And you also flew about a thousand feet above the trees mostly. So yeah. you were essentially out of harm's way because you were too far up for the enemy to normally to yes. shoot at you. Normally. Yeah. But sometimes you did get down there, I guess, because of cloud cover, right? Well, cloud cover or um, if we were looking for something in particular, sometimes you can't see from above what, um, what you're looking for. I could tell from a thousand feet, for example, after a while you become trained to where you can pick things out, your eyes get better. And I could tell from a thousand feet up if a trail had been used in the last uh, little while mm -hmm. just by the difference in color. And then we could drop down. Now understand, uh, again, I told you this uh, before, there's a difference between courage and confidence. Right. I didn't have a lot of courage, but I developed a lot of confidence. And you might call it uh, being young and stupid too, but uh, I could drop my flaps and fly that plane very slowly. And we would fly over a trail where we'd seen that somebody had been there. In one particular case, an American had been killed by a sniper. And we were looking for the guy and we followed this trail by the back seater looking to see which direction the footprints went. Mm -hmm. And so you had to get down pretty low to do that. But uh, again, I didn't, as long as I was inside my airplane, I didn't feel threatened. So it, uh, it didn't matter how, how low or how high it was. And that's where the confidence came in. Yeah. Uh, you brought some pictures with you, and I yes. want to uh, uh, go to some of those. We're going to uh, close in on uh, some of the pictures to sort of give people an idea. First off, you can look right there at that monitor right over there, and you can see the first picture. What uh, oh, yeah. That is you, and what are we looking at? There? I'm in training there at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, by that time, I believe I'm a first lieutenant. And uh, that may have even been the day where the wives came out to uh, watch us land and take off over a string barrier with pennants hanging down. So uh, that was the... And that is the, that's the bird dog. That's, that's what the bird you dog were. right there. 
that's what you were trained to fly the, the last part of your training and that correct. you flew the, your entire uh, tour of Vietnam. That's correct. Okay, here we go to another picture. Okay, that's the ocean in the background and that's the uh, one end of the runway uh, is right below that picture and that hangar is our hangar and the building you see to the left was where I lived the first six months I was there. It's an uh, old uh, uh, French uh, post and um, we had running water, no heat, but, but running water. So I took a lot of cold showers. And those are revetments made out of 55 gallon oil drums that we parked the aircraft in that are surrounding the hangar. In fact, there is an aircraft there in that one revetment. It's an Air Force O2. How was all of this built? How? Uh, yeah, who, who built? Most of that was built by the French. That was built by the French, okay. okay. And you see that red cross there, that's the dust off pad. Right. Because uh, after I left there, they moved an aid station into that building, and that's where we would take wounded. Okay. What are we looking at here? Okay, that's a typical fire base. I believe that was a 105 battery of artillery, usually six tubes of, art of 105 millimeter uh, artillery. Mm -hmm. And that's out in the middle of that coastal plain somewhere. I don't know which one that was. We had about three. 105 batteries and one battery that was a combination of 8 inch and 175. Now you took this picture from your aircraft? Yes. Christmas time. There's a Christmas in Vietnam and we had a little <laughs> beach party and uh, the man on the right was the platoon leader at the time. He was a captain, Billy J. C. S. E. A. Y. and he had been an NCO with the 1st Infantry Division his first tour. So this was his second exposure to Vietnam, and that's me sitting on the, on the little boat uh, looking a lot thinner than I look today. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was Christmas away from home, so you tried to get as many smiles as you could. Oh, yeah. We, we smiled a lot. You, you, uh, people can do that even under difficult circumstances. They can make, let humor right. and uh, good times uh, release the stress. Final picture, this is a picture that we think that someone else took and that that indeed could be you. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's but been a long time. Uh, that's what the, uh, the bird dog looked like flying. That's right. Um, the reason we think uh, that that's my bird dog in the background is because that's not my camera that took that picture. Right. And um, uh, somebody would have given that to me to, uh, to take home. In the right side of that picture, you see the back end of a, of a um, rocket tube. Mm -hmm. My bird dogs were armed with four 2.75 inch white phosphorus rockets and we use them for marking the targets. Two under each wing. Wow. Fascinating pictures. Thank you for bringing those. Um, you talked about I think the first time you went up in Vietnam I believe you got shot at. Oh yeah. And you weren't really sure that you were what, what exactly it was. Tell that story. Well it was the first flight in our province and a Marine uh, First Lieutenant who was an ancient guy, he was all of 30 years old, mm -hmm. so we thought he was really old. Uh, he took me out into the uh, area to fire naval gunfire, and on the way out, he said, I think there's a guy in this big bush down there, and the bush was about 30 feet across and 30 feet tall. So being the fresh out of flight school guy I was, I knew how to bring the plane down and fly around the bush, and sure enough, I saw the guy, and I heard this noise, and I didn't recognize the noise, it was a clattering sound and I went around the bush and it stopped and as I came back around the side where the guy was I heard the noise again and I thought what's wrong with my airplane I looked at the gauges and couldn't see anything wrong came back around one more time and I thought when I heard that noise again I thought Larry Doak is pulling a trick on a rookie this is something they do to all the new guys mm -hmm. and I turned around and looked at him in the back seat and I said, what is that noise? And he was sitting there with his feet on the floor and his hands in his lap, calmly looking out the window. And we were probably about 50 feet above the ground. And he said, you idiot, we're getting shot at. <laughs> and that was an AK-47 shooting at us. And that's so, what it sounded like. That's what it First sounded like. First time you'd heard it. First time I'd heard it. But you probably didn't forget it. I remembered. I can still hear it. <laughs> you can still hear it. One of the fascinating stories that you told me uh, was a, a, about a mission that ended up ended up a lot better than it could have. And you know which one I'm talking about, where you had to do a little wrestling with a, a parachute and a flare. That's right. Talk about how that developed and how it came out. Well, uh, one night, and I did a lot of night flying, and I enjoyed flying at night. Mm -hmm. um, I was the alert pilot, and I was called out to help 
a place where a, uh, either a uh, Vietnamese National Guard or Arvin Army of Vietnam compound had been hit and had taken some casualties. And we were trying to get the uh, North Vietnamese that had hit them. Uh, and we had an Air Force gunship, a C-119 uh, gunship with a 20 millimeter Vulcan Gatling gun. And they were flying about 4,500 feet and flying north of the highway. And I was flying south of the highway. We did racetrack patterns. And they were kicking out flares. And even with the flares, they couldn't see the ground, but I could. And I could actually adjust their fire by telling them how far off the, the uh, target they were. And the target was stream beds. And we figured the enemy would use the stream beds to hide their movement as they went back north to the mountains to escape. Well, I didn't realize it, but they had kicked out an extra flare south of the highway so that a dust-off helicopter could go in and pick up the wounded. Mm -hmm. And of course, these things were burning out above my altitude. And I remember looking out to the right, I was flying uh, west at the time, looking out to the right and looking in front of me just in time to see a white blur in front of my nose. And it's one of those things where it's instant recognition. You don't have to think the words. You just know what it is. And I hit right rudder and right aileron as hard as I could to try to turn away. And not being the bravest guy in the world, I actually flinched. And I sort of closed my eyes and turned my head to the right. And the next thing I knew, I hear this loud wham. And the plane snapped to the left. And I thought I had lost a wing. But I kept the right rudder in, and I got it straightened out, and I looked up. And the wham was this canister that hangs down that is coated with chemicals that burns, and that's the flare. And it's suspended from a 16-foot diameter canopy parachute. And the canister had hit the underside of the wing and left about a three-inch dent. And the parachute deployed over the top of the wing with its shroud lines wrapped around my rocket tubes. Mm -hmm. And it acted like a big air brake. So at that point, it slowed me down to about 70 knots, which is a little more than 70 miles an hour. And I had the plane going straight, but I could only make left turns. And the winds were very strong. And I told the Air Force uh, pilot that I couldn't play anymore and I was going, going back to the base, which was about 20 minutes away. And uh, so I did a left turn back to the base. And I was oh, maybe five minutes into the flight back. And I remembered that I had a Vietnamese observer in the back seat. I'd been sort of busy and had, had unfortunately forgotten about him. So I keyed the mic and turned and smiled at him real big and said, pretty exciting, huh? <laughs> and uh, this guy was the littlest observer we had, the littlest Vietnamese I ever knew. He had ripped this baby fire extinguisher out of a metal clamp on the back of my seat. He hadn't opened the clamp, we found out later. He ripped it out. He was holding it as if that would put out the fire because what happened was dragging that thing through the air was like blowing on the embers of a campfire mm -hmm. and it burst into flame. And mm. it was giving off enough light that I could read the lettering on my white phosphorus rockets and I could see my fuel vent dripping fuel. Wow. And I can still see it today. And this young man was so scared that you've heard the expression trembling like a leaf. His entire body from his head to his boots, and I looked, was vibrating. He was, he was so scared. And the stream from that puny little fire extinguisher wasn't going to get the, to the flare. But eventually it went out of his own accord and I, I did a left turn onto final. I felt I had to land into the wind. Unfortunately, uh, into the wind meant I landed over the face of a cliff, that this airfield was built on the edge of a 200 foot cliff. And in getting on final, starting my descent, I'd never landed in that much wind with a parachute hanging over my wing before, so I didn't know how to judge it. And my rate of descent was carrying me into the face of the cliff. Mm -hmm. And I added full power and was still coming down into the face of the cliff. And the only other choice was to turn off into the ocean at night, dark night, landing away from shore with no flotation gear, with a survival vest full of radios and first aid kits and water and uh, two bandoliers of M16 magazines around my chest like Pancho Villa and a Vietnamese in the back seat that I'm responsible for to get out. And I figured we'd have to walk along the bottom because there's no way we could swim with the combat boots and all that. So I elected to stay on course as long as I could and only turn off and ruin the plane in the water if, if uh, that was the last choice. And whether you ascribe it to the power finally starting to lift me up 
or the parachute ripping or God lifting up and giving me a little mercy. Uh, I remember clearing the, the face of the cliff close enough that I could look down and see the Tanglefoot barbed wire and a bunker to my left and cleared a road that ran right there and landed on the overrun of the runway. And there's a picture of uh, my crew chief giving me a, flat, a plaque with a piece of the parachute on it and a picture of me holding the parachute by the plane. So it was an interesting night. Interesting night. That ended up good. There were good nights and there were bad nights. And unfortunately, we only have a, a, about a minute left. You, you talked about a reflection that you had when you left Vietnam that changed 20 years later. Mm -hmm. I need you to be real quick, but tell me that again. Well, knowing what I know today about our effort in Vietnam, um, I would do it again. I would absolutely do it again because I felt what I did was important. But for years, I regretted not having killed more North Vietnamese, more communists. Now, however, I regret having had to kill anybody. I'd still do it. I'd still go there and do my job. But I realized that most of those people were forced to be there. They had families. And I regret having to kill anybody. And I think uh, that's the way we ought to look at war is that you don't, you don't uh, relish it. You don't uh, relish uh, hurting people. But sometimes you've got to do it. John Anderson, thank you for your service. And thank you for being here. I wish we had more time. It's a wonderful story. Like so many brave soldiers of Vietnam, John Anderson indeed found himself in harm's way. And as he himself has said, he did his job not without fear, but indeed with confidence in his training and his ability. Like all veterans of that conflict, it's sometimes a difficult story to tell, and it always should be. It's the same kind of stories we hear today from the war on terror. Also difficult to tell, but we must all listen with uncommon pride. We salute Brazos Valley veteran Major John Anderson and thank him and all veterans for their service. And thank you to our underwriter, First National Bank. I'm Tom Turbeville. Please join us next time on Veterans of the Valley.